The Red Hot Chili Peppers originated in Los Angeles, California in 1983. They are one of the best-selling bands of all time, with over 80 million records sold worldwide. They have been nominated for 16 Grammy Awards and were awarded six. They're currently holding records for most number one singles, most weeks at number one, most top 10 songs, and in 2012, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The band originally consisted of singer Anthony Kiedis, guitarist Halel Slovak, bassist Flea, and drummer Jack Irons. All four attended Fairfax High School in Los Angeles and all shared colorful backgrounds. Kiedis was born November 1, 1962 in Grand Rapids, Michigan to Peggy Noble and John Michael Kiedis. In 1966, when he was only three years old, his parents divorced and he was then raised by his mother in Michigan. In 1974, when Kiedis was 12 years old, he moved to LA to live with his father full time. At that point, his father was a struggling actor known as Blackie Dammit, who was well known for selling drugs. He introduced his son to marijuana and cocaine, which they frequently used together. Kiedis accidentally tried heroin for the first time at the age of 14, mistaking the substance for cocaine. He first became involved with future bandmates when he attended a show where Chain Reaction was playing. He was first brought on as a roadie and hype man. Flea was born Michael Peter Balsery on October 16, 1962, in Melbourne, Australia. When Flea was four, their family moved to New York for his father's career. However, in 1971, his parents were divorced and his father returned to Australia. Flea and his siblings stayed with their mother Patricia, who soon remarried a jazz musician. The family moved again to Los Angeles, California, where his stepfather frequently invited musicians to the house for jam sessions, which was a wonderful introduction to playing music for Flea. He soon became fascinated with the trumpet. However, his stepfather was also considered a raging alcoholic, who became involved in shootouts with the police. Flea would later admit that it was a very violent and alcoholic household, that he grew up terrified of his parents, particularly his father figures. To cope, Flea began smoking marijuana at the age of 13. He then met and became close with future bandmates, who helped him transition from jazz music to rock, with the most help coming from Jack Irons. Slovak was born April 13, 1962, in Haifa, Israel. Both his parents were survivors of the Holocaust. They later settled in Queens, New York City, and by 1967 had relocated to Los Angeles. As a child, he had a keen interest in art and would often spend time painting with his mother. He received his first guitar at the age of 13 as a bar mitzvah present and would often play the instrument late into the night. Slovak went on to form the band Chain Reaction, who soon changed their name to Anthem. This included Elaine Johan, Hillel Slovak, Todd Strassman, and Jack Irons. Strassman was later replaced by Flea and Johan with Kiedis. After graduating high school, they changed that band's name to What Is This? Irons was born on July 18, 1962, in LA. He is of Jewish background and grew up using everything he could find as drumsticks, playing along with whatever was on the radio. He later talked his parents into buying him a drum set and took a drum class. He and Slovak became a pair after forming a KISS tribute band together. Slovak, Kiedis, and Flea spent the most time together and were using a variety of drugs including LSD, heroin, cocaine, meth, and speed on a regular basis. The group soon formed a separate band called Tony Flo and the Miraculously Majestic Masters of Mayhem. The first show they played only had 30 members in attendance but the performance had such a great response from the audience that they were asked to return the following week. Soon after, they changed their band name to Red Hot Chili Peppers and continued to play shows at various LA clubs and other venues. Irons and Slovak had always considered the Red Hot Chili Peppers to be a side project. And although in November of 1983, they struck a seven album record deal with EMI and Enigma, the pair chose to leave the band shortly after to focus on their main band, What Is This? who had also landed a deal around the same time. Rather than dissolving the band, Kiedis and Flea chose to hold auditions for new members. Cliff Martinez, a friend of Flea's and member of the punk band Weirdos, and Jack Sherman were the replacements. 
they released their self-titled debut album in August of 1984. Despite musical differences and disagreements between the original band and their new mates, as well as the producer Andy Gill. The album didn't set any sales records, but airplay from college radio and MTV helped them maintain a fan base. Later that year, they embarked on a tour of Grind, where they played 66 shows in only 64 days. During the tour, the tension grew between Kiedis and Sherman, and when the tour ended, Sherman was fired. Slovak, who had just quit the band What Is This, rejoined in early 1985. Because of the musical dispute with the previous producer, they produced their second album, Freaky Styly, with George Clinton. There was a much better musical chemistry, and they were able to evolve and improve their style more easily. However, the record, released August 1985, achieved only slightly more success than the first, failing to make any impressions on any chart. In the spring of 1986, the band started working on their third studio album. EMI gave them a budget of $5,000 to record a demo tape. The band chose producer Keith Levine because of his shared interest in drugs. Levine and Slovak decided to put aside a budget of $2,000 for heroin and cocaine, which created tension within the band from the other members. Martinez was becoming increasingly displeased with the band's choices, but it still not quit. So Kiedis and Flea finally fired him. Soon after, and much to everyone's surprise, Jack Irons rejoined the band, which meant all of the original members had reunited. And definitely the energy is back again with the new old Red Hot Chili. Energy never left, man. It's just, I mean, it's just compounded and gotten stronger and stronger as time goes by. When right. people leave and they come back, you know, does it make it stronger than it was in the, in the beginning? Well, it's always a little burst of energy when you get someone back, you know, but, I mean, we always kept the fire burning the whole time through. You know, we never slowed down for a second. Mm -hmm. But now that we have the original, all the original members back, it's even better, and it's just, it's much more of a heavy, soulful groove thing. Slovak and Kiedis soon developed debilitating heroin addictions. Kiedis, who had a more extreme disposition to addiction, became so deeply enslaved by heroin that he lost his drive and desire to write songs and music, and regularly dozed during rehearsal. Slovak, on the other hand, was better at concealing the growing severity of his addiction. The band gave Kiedis the ultimatum of getting his drug habit under control or being fired from the band. They had recently won the LA Weekly Band of the Year Award, which gave Kiedis the motivation to get clean and continue making music. After calling his mother for guidance, she promptly sent Kiedis to rehab. After completing the program, he was feeling inspired and wrote the song, Fight Like a Brave. After spending a full month away from the band, he rejoined the Red Hot Chili Peppers in LA to complete their third studio album, which ended up being called The Uplift Mofo Party Plan. They had tried to hire a new producer, Rick Rubin, but he declined. The band finally hired Michael Beinhorn as a last resort. Kiedis planned to record the album in 10 days and write songs between recording sessions. Miraculously, the songs formed quickly and the album was coming together. The final studio recording at the Capitol Records building proved difficult. After 55 days of sobriety, Kiedis began disappearing frequently in search of drugs. He claimed it was in celebration of his new music. The early recording process was a mess, but the rest of the band made the most of it. The return of Jack Irons was an important element to their chemistry, and in September of 1987, they were able to release their album. When Kiedis relapsed and began using again, Slovak was soon to follow. The two began spending time together away from the band and their girlfriends for days on end. Against all odds, this was their first album to appear on any charts. Although it only peaked at 148 on the Billboard 200, this was a major success compared to the first two. In the beginning of the Uplift tour, the band had decided to work together and help each other steer clear of heroin. An entry in Slovak's diary on January 21st, 1988, discusses his attempts to begin a new drug-free phase of life. However, during the tour, both Slovak and Kiedis suffered from intense withdrawal symptoms. Slovak at one point had a mental breakdown and left the show, 
leaving the band to finish without the lead guitar. He was replaced by Dwayne McKnight for a handful of shows until his return. Kiedis and Slovak agreed to attend drug addiction counseling, but Slovak had difficulty admitting his addiction was serious enough that he needed the help. After returning home, Slovak chose to distance himself from the rest of the band and fell deeper into his addiction than ever before. He had stopped painting and writing and avoided all contact from everyone. The only contact he had made was a call to his brother on June 24th, where Slovak admitted that he was struggling to stay clean. On June 27, 1988, Halal Slovak was found dead by police in his Hollywood apartment. The autopsy report stated that he had died two days earlier by overdose, the day after he had pleaded his brother for help. He had used the method called speedballing, which is a combination of cocaine and heroin. Kiedis left the city and was not present at Slovak's funeral, which is referenced in the song he later wrote, This is the Place. Although his friend had just passed, he continued to use. After returning to LA, the band and their managers sat down to figure out what to do next. Jack Irons subsequently left the group and later struggled with depression. Years later, he would join the band Pearl Jam. Although they had tragically lost their guitarist, and their drummer had just quit, Kiedis and Flea decided to move ahead as a tribute to what Slovak had helped them create. They started looking for musicians to fill the spots, and for Slovak's replacement, it made sense to use Dwayne McKnight, who had filled in for Slovak before. D.H. Peligro of Dead Kennedys replaced Irons. After choosing new members and having a plan in place, Kiedis decided to enter rehab once again and deal with his drug problem once and for all. After two weeks into the program, he finally agreed to visit Slovak's grave. And although he was reluctant to be there, when he began talking to Slovak, he broke down and began crying uncontrollably. Two weeks after that, he had completed rehab for the second time and returned to the band to begin their next tour. Three shows into that tour, McKnight was fired due to the lack of chemistry with the other members. He was so upset about being kicked out of the band, he threatened to burn down Kiedis' home. Shortly after McKnight was fired, their new drummer Peligro introduced Kiedis to the then-teenage guitarist John Frusciante. Kiedis recognized John from outside a show he had played the year before. John Frusciante was born March 5, 1970, in Queens, New York. His father, John Sr., was a Juilliard-trained pianist, and his mother was once a singer, who gave up her career to be a stay-at-home mom. Their family moved to Tucson, Arizona, and then on to Florida, where his father served as a Broward County judge. His parents separated, and he and his mother moved to Santa Monica, California. A year later, they moved inland, closer to Los Angeles, with his mother's new boyfriend, who supported and encouraged John's interest in becoming an artist. He, along with many young people in the area at the time, became deeply involved in the punk rock scene. He first attended a Red Hot Chili Peppers performance at 15, and quickly became a fan. He idolized Slovak and had familiarized himself with all of the guitar and bass parts from their first three albums. He had even became acquainted with Slovak a few short months before his passing. John had became friends with former Dead Kennedys drummer Peligro in early 1988, and they often jammed together. Peligro later invited Flea to join in on their jam sessions, and John and Flea developed a musical chemistry almost immediately. Flea admits this is where he first played the bass riff to Nobody Weird Like Me. Fast forward to the introduction to Kiedis. With Peligro and Flea vouching for him, they decided to audition him for the part. John had an almost intimate knowledge of the band's music, and both Flea and Kiedis were impressed by him, and soon after he was asked to join the band. He played his first show with the Peppers in September 1988. They began writing music together right away, and started a short tour they called the Turd Town Tour. But by November, Kiedis and Flea had decided to fire Peligro because of his increasing problems with drugs and alcohol. Like McKnight, Peligro did not take the news well. Kiedis would later admit that firing Peligro was one of the hardest things the band ever had to do, as they did vibe well together. However, it was a tough love decision, 
and Peligro's road to sobriety began shortly after he was fired. Again looking to recruit another drummer, a friend of the band suggested Chad Smith, claiming he was the best drummer she had ever seen. They agreed to audition Smith, but he showed up late and was the last to audition. Luckily, when they started jamming, Smith and Fleet instantly became connected musically, and the Peppers believed he would be a good fit. Not only did they get along musically, Smith had a great humor and got along with the band socially, he is claiming he had left the band laughing for almost a half an hour after his audition. Chadwick Gaylord Smith was born on October 25, 1961, in St. Paul, Minnesota. He started playing drums at seven years old and had never received any formal training. Smith brought an entirely different style to the table, and his heavy metal was a great contrast to their punk rock approach. By December 1988, he was officially initiated into the band. Unlike their previous album, pre-production for Mother's Milk went much smoother. Their first few tracks were recorded during March and early April of 1989, which were formed from jam sessions and had little creative interference from their returning producer, Michael Beinhorn. However, Beinhorn had applied some pressure to the band to create a hit, and both John and Kiedis became frustrated with him. Regardless, in August 1989, Mother's Milk was released and peaked at number 52 on the Billboard 200. It was certified gold by March 1990 and is now certified as platinum with over 500,000 units sold. The success of their album prompted a label bidding war and the Peppers ended up deciding to sign with Warner Brothers Records. They once again asked for Rick Rubin to produce an album and this time he agreed. The band spent six months recording their fifth studio album with long periods of rehearsal, songwriting, and brainstorming new ideas. The producer Ruben decided to think outside of the box when it came to recording this album, suggesting the mansion that was once owned by Harry Houdini, to which the band agreed. A crew was hired to set up a studio space and other equipment required for production. The band decided to stay in the mansion until the album was finished recording. Flea's brother documented the recording and later released the film titled Funky Monks. Unable to decide on an album title, Ruben picked the name of the one song that stood out the most to him. Blood Sugar Sex Magic. In September 1991, Blood Sugar Sex Magic was released. The album sold over 12 million copies and was listed number 310 on the Rolling Stones list of 500 greatest albums of all time. Their Blood Sugar Sex Magic tour featured Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and Smashing Pumpkins three of that era's biggest up-and-coming bands in alternative music. Their album's success made them instant rock stars, but John Frusciante was blindsided by this newfound fame. He began to develop a serious dislike for the band's popularity, and problems between John and Kiedis started to develop. Kiedis and John got into many heated discussions backstage after concerts. John was adamant that he had joined the band wanting to play smaller venues like the band used to. He didn't want this level of success. The final dates of the tour were filled with tension, when John started disconnecting from the group and purposely playing songs differently to get under frontman Kiedis' skin. Unknown to the rest of the band, John had started sinking heavily into drugs and isolating himself from them, which led up to him abruptly quitting the band hours before a show during their Japanese tour in May 1992. The band reached out to Dave Navarro, who had just split from Jane's addiction, but he was also seriously involved with drugs at the time. They held rehearsals and eventually hired guitarist Eric Marshall to replace John for the Lollapalooza Festival in 1992. In September of 1992, the band with Marshall performed Give It Away at the MTV Video Music Awards. 
The band was nominated for seven awards, winning three, including Viewer's Choice. In February 1993, they performed the same song at the Grammy Awards, which won them their first Grammy that evening. This show marked the end of the Blood Sugar Sex Magic Tour and Marshall's final appearance with the band. Finally clean, enter Dave Navarro. On October 31st, 1993, Flea was set to perform on stage at the newly opened club called The Viper Room with the up-and-coming actor and musician River Phoenix. The club was jointly owned by Johnny Depp, Anthony Fox, and three silent investors. It quickly became popular within the LA punk rock scene. Prashante was also present and was good friends with River. On this night, 23-year-old River was given the same concoction that ended the life of Hillel Slovak, as well as many other notable figures. He passed away outside the club later that evening, in the presence of his siblings and girlfriend at the time. There are a few different theories surrounding this event, but we'll explore that in a different video. John and Flea were greatly affected by this and the Red Hot Chili Peppers went on an indefinite hiatus. Six months later, on April 8, 1994, Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain was found dead after supposedly being missing for a number of days. It is still disputed whether or not he had chosen to take his own life, or if it was taken from him. But we'll save the details about that for a separate video as well. Regardless, he had also struggled with heroin abuse, and what some would call depression. <laughs> Early this morning at 6 o'clock, I was sedated in the arm. Mm, you must have liked that. We all know about your little problem. Oh, <laughs> needles, needles, keep them coming. <laughs> he had been dead in his home for days, with coroners estimating his actual day of passing to be April 5th. Although he was only an acquaintance to the band, it was a dark reminder of what had happened to River Phoenix, as well as their close friend and bandmate Slovak. Also, much of what contributed to Kurt's unhappiness and dislike for the music industry was a mirror image of the distaste that John felt about the band's rising popularity. He was spiraling out of control with his addiction, and close friends of Frashanti's, Johnny Depp and Gibby Haynes, the lead singer of the Butthole Surfers, made a 12-minute documentary called Stuff, which in and of itself was an artistic presentation of John's state of self-destruction. Currently shown, this film included actual footage of John in his apartment at the time, and contained altered snippets of John's solo recordings, presumably to act as an audio-visual intervention. With everyone aside from John ready to perform again, 
Dave Navarro joined the Peppers for Woodstock in the summer of 1994, as well as a follow-up tour, including an appearance as an opener for the Rolling Stones. According to Kiedis, however, opening for the Stones was terrible. While everything appeared normal on the outside, the relationship between the band and Navarro had began to deteriorate. Navarro had a much different taste in music, and the issue became more apparent over the next year. Kiedis had also began to struggle with his own heroin addiction once again. After a dental procedure, he was prescribed Valium, which led to a relapse that this time he managed to keep well hidden from the band. It soon became apparent that Kiedis had taken John for granted, and the production of their fifth album, One Hot Minute, came at a much slower pace. Flea and Kiedis took several vacations together, and Flea ultimately took a much bigger role in the writing process, even singing lead on P. The album was finally released in September 1995, after many delays and setbacks. Although they had a volatile relationship, Navarro had brought a stylistic departure to the band's usual sound, which now closely resembled psychedelic rock. The band described the album as darker and sadder compared to the previous. Many of the lyrics written by Kiedis contained drug references, including the lead single, Warped, which he was surprised that no one else in the band noticed, and didn't connect that Kiedis was using again. The song Tearjerker was written about Kurt Cobain, while Transcending, which was written by Flea, was about River Phoenix. This was clearly a trying time of great despair for the band. The band played 16 shows on their European tour for one hot minute in 1995. A US tour was to follow, but was postponed until early 1996, after Chad Smith broke his wrist. By 1997, the band had cancelled almost all their shows, mostly due to problems within the band. John continued to be active with his addiction during this time. It wasn't until late 1996, after more than five years of using heroin, he decided to quit cold turkey. Flea was exhausted, tired of playing the same songs each night, and was seriously thinking about quitting the band. Meanwhile, Kiedis had been involved in a motorcycle accident, which left his arm in a sling, and led to yet another drug relapse. Navarro had also began using drugs again. They only played one single show in 1997. After struggling to curb his cocaine and alcohol use, John entered rehab in January 1998, where they began a full-time program. They helped him heal his body and mind. When he arrived, he had a potentially lethal dental infection, which resulted in the removal of all of his teeth. He also required skin grafts to repair the abscesses and other extensive damage to his arms. By April 1998, Navarro quit after causing friction and showing no interest in creating any new music or becoming a permanent fixture in the band. Fans became concerned that this was the end of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. The Peppers were very much on the verge of breaking up. Flea told Kiedis he could only imagine carrying on if they got John back in the band. Kiedis was unsure John would want to rejoin since the two had unresolved personal differences after he had quit in 1992. With John finally clean and free of his addiction, Kiedis and Flea invited him back. After Flea visited him in his home and invited him personally, John began sobbing and admitted that nothing would make him happier in the world than to rejoin. Flea arranged for John and Kiedis to meet up and try and resolve whatever personal differences they had, but by this time they had no bad blood towards each other and both were excited to make music together again. John stated that he does not view his drug use as a dark period in his life. He considers it rather a period of rebirth where he found himself and cleared his mind. After six long years, the group was reunited and ready to jump headfirst into creating new music. Despite the long period in which John had not played guitar, Having lost his in a house fire from which he barely escaped, the group began jamming in Flea's garage and it didn't take long for John to regain his talent. New songs began to formulate and John's return became a key component to the band restoring a healthy morale. 
In June of 1999, after more than a year of jamming, writing, and producing their seventh studio album, Californication was released. You guys, let's show everybody we care, show these people we care about them, show them we love each other and we care about ourselves. The album sold over 16 million copies and became their most successful album to date. The record had three hit singles including Scar Tissue, Other Side, and Californication. Although much of the success of the album was attributed to John's return, it was noted that Kiedis' vocals had also greatly improved. In July 1999, as part of the band's two-year-long world tour in support of their new album, they played Woodstock, which became infamous for the violence that ensued. A small fire escalated into vandalism and required the attention of riot squads. The crowds are blowing up CO2 tanks from the tractor trailers. They got the troops in there with riot gear. They're forcing everybody out. Mass chaos. Mass chaos. After completing their world tour for Californication, they immediately began recording their eighth album, By The Way. Initially, they had a faster, more hardcore punk approach, to which producer Rick Rubin rejected. John suggested a different style, and Flea and John faced somewhat of a power struggle. Fleet once again considered quitting the band, but the two eventually resolved their issues. The album was finally released in July 2002, with four singles, By The Way, The Zephyr Song, Can't Stop, and Universally Speaking. This album was actually their most tame to date, many songs being slow and melodic ballads as opposed to the rock, rap, funk style we've come to know and love. John paid extra close attention, adding keyboard riffs and different string arrangements. The album was followed by an 18-month world tour. In 2004, Kiedis published a memoir titled Scar Tissue. It was originally meant to be a collection of stories about his drug abuse in his youth, but quickly led to a full-blown autobiography. Later that year, Flea announced he would begin working on his own memoir of sorts. In 2006, they released the Grammy award-winning Stadium Arcadium, produced once again by Rick Rubin. I, well, I mean, I, I feel like the quality of the music is the highest that we've ever done in terms of it being a really far-reaching dynamic record. But more when I say that, it's more about my own emotional being in regards to, to the music and, and where I've, my place in, in being a musician is and just the feeling in the band for me. Just when we started this band, I felt like it was just this natural explosion that I couldn't control. Mm. It was just this beautiful thing, like all I had to do was sit back and let it take me, and it did, wildly. And I felt that way um, in the creation of this record, the same way. This is the first time like we've ever made an album for me where I, it just seemed like everybody in the band was on 10, you know? Mm. It just seemed like everybody, everybody was at their best and everybody was supporting each other. It wasn't always like, uh, Blood Sugar it wasn't, Californication wasn't, by the way it wasn't, so. It's, it's, it, for me, this is like a real special album for that reason. I, I don't feel like the, the band's ever been so unified since I've been in the band, you know. 38 songs were created with the intention of being released on three separate albums, being spaced six months apart. The band instead chose to release a 28-track double album and release nine of the ten as B-sides. It was their first album to debut as number one on the U.S. charts where it stayed for two weeks. Later that year, they began another world tour for Stadium Arcadium, starting in Europe. During this tour, they were joined by John's friend Josh Klinghoffer, who had contributed guitar parts, backup vocals, and keyboards to the last album. They started touring almost non-stop. In February 2007, they won five Grammys. But following the end of the long and grueling Stadium Arcadium tour, the members decided to take an extended break. Kiedis became a father to a son named Everly Bear from his relationship with supermodel Heather Christie, with whom he had been with since 2004. The two had begun dating when she was only 18, and he was 41. Kiedis admits that she was inspiration for songs on the Stadium Arcadium album, She's Only 18, and Desecration Smile, 
were written directly about her. This had proven to be one of his longest-lasting relationships. Many of Kiedis' past relationships have been the fuel to his songs. The song I Could Have Lied from Blood Sugar Sex Magic was written about his brief relationship with Sinead O'Connor in 1990. The song Emmett Remus from Californication was after a fling with singer Sporty Spice from the Spice Girls. Johanna Logan, with whom Kiedis dated off and on between 1998 and 2003, was inspiration for songs from the Californication era with songs like Fat Dance. Their breakup was fuel behind the album By The Way, released in 2002. Between the years 2008 and 2009, Kita spent time with his newborn son. Flea took music theory classes at the University of Southern California, planning to release an instrumental solo album. John continued his solo career and released his album The Empyrean. Chad Smith worked with Sammy Hagar, Joe Satriani, and Michael Anthony creating the supergroup Chickenfoot. He also worked on a solo project called Chad Smith's Bombastic Meatballs. In October 2009, the band reunited, but now with Josh Klinghoffer on guitar, whom John had basically introduced and trained to be his replacement. John Frusciante explained on his MySpace page that there was no drama or anger about his second time leaving the band, and that the other members supported and understood his decision. So with their new guitarist, and after having a well-deserved break, they began touring again. By February 2010, they had decided Josh would be the official replacement. In September of 2010, they began working on their 10th studio album, with now longtime producer Rick Rubin. It was shaping up to be another double album for the amount of material they recorded. Rick decided it would probably be too much following the Stadium Arcadium double album, so they settled on 14 songs. But according to Flea, between October 2009 and August 2010, they had recorded almost 70 songs. I'm With You, their 10th studio album, was released in August 2011. They topped the charts in 18 countries, but it did not result in a number one chart spot. Between 2011 and 2014, the band toured all over the world, including dates in Asia, South America, Europe, and the US. In total, they played 158 shows, which broke records for longest time touring without a break. By December of 2014, the band was already back in the studio recording their 11th album. This time, they had decided not to use Rick Rubin as their producer, and it would be the first time since 1989 they would work with somebody else. In January 2015, Flea disclosed on Twitter that they'd be using Danger Mouse as their producer. But later that month, Flea had a skiing accident which resulted in a broken arm and delayed the album recording for six months. Their 11th studio album, The Getaway, was finally released in June of 2016, amidst their summer festival tour. It was heavily based on Kiedis' two-year relationship with Australian supermodel Helena Vestergaard, who was only 19 when they began dating in 2012, while he was 50. In retrospect, Kiedis questions the age difference being part of the problems he's had in his past relationships. During another interview in 2016, Kiedis admits to having over a hundred sexual partners. When asked about marriage and growing old alone, Kiedis responded by saying, Maybe it's because I never learned to live in a relationship. And as silly as it sounds, I still don't understand women. They remain a mystery. Do we focus on finding a person that fits us, or will we remain single? I'm open to both. If the right one comes, wonderful. If not, I accept what the universe has intended for me. Kiedis also professed that he had been taken advantage of when he was only 13 by singer and actress Cher, who was 29 at the time. His father, being an actor, was good friends with Sonny and Cher, and they had often babysat Kiedis. Between that and the unhealthy home environment he shared with his father, it's no wonder Kiedis has been able to have a healthy, age-appropriate relationship. He later perpetuated the same crime when he was 23 with a 14-year-old girl. In September 2017, the band began their Getaway World Tour, starting in North America, which featured their original drummer Jack Irons as an opening act on all dates. 
The tour concluded in October of 2017 and had consisted of 151 shows. In 2018, the band reported that they'd be taking a break from touring, save a couple small festival tours, in order to focus on their 12th studio album. After many setbacks, Flea has given an update about his personal memoir, which he began working on in 2004, entitled Acid for the Children, scheduled to be released in 2019. In May 2018, Chad Smith created a music radio talk show on Sirius XM titled Volume West, alongside Yahoo Entertainment editor Lindsay Parker, which airs every Monday. Back in 2015, John Frusciante was court-ordered to pay his ex-wife for four years, Nicole Turley, $53,000 a month to maintain the quality of her life as well as foot the bill for her musical career, which John is considered to be more of a wasteful hobby. He was also forced to pay over $70,000 for her legal expenses. By 2018, he will have paid just under $2 million in alimony. There aren't really any updates about what Anthony Kiedis or Josh Klinghoffer have been up to following the Getaway Tour, which concluded in October 2017, aside from working with the band on their 12th album. <laughs>